Amen. Now, the part of the passage I want to focus in there in Hebrews 11, of course, it's a very famous passage, great, powerful passage, but I want to focus in particularly on verses 8 through 10, where the Bible reads that beginning of verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should hereafter receive from inheritance, obeyed, and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the, of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now I want to take a special note of the phrase there, in verse 8, where it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place. The Bible says there that he was called to go out. That there was something that God told him specifically to do. And what God told Abraham to do, he said, you're going to go out. Of course, we know he was found in the land of, the, of Ur, the Chaldees, and then he was dwelling uh, with the heathen there. And when God decided to begin to, to work in mankind and to, and to uh, select a particular group of people that he was going to call his nation as a, and make them a light unto the Gentiles, of course, he began with, with Abraham. And when he found Abraham... He found him in his own land, and then he told him very specifically that he was going to go to a very specific place. And the Bible says that he didn't know where he went, that he went out not, not uh, knowing not whither he went, and he went out by faith. But Abraham was called to go. He had, he had, and, and the Bible said, goes on and says that when he was called to go, that he obeyed and went out. Now that's going, that means that, that Abraham, that call that was put upon him, that was a, a commandment. That was something he was told to do, because it says that he obeyed and went out. It wasn't an option. It wasn't something that God just kind of put on the table and said, you know, Abraham, if you'd like this opportunity, I'd really like to use you. I'd really like to make you, you know, a special person in the scriptures and use you to, to, to you know, uh, start a great nation. You know, it's, it's an option for you. you no, know, he said he commanded him. He was told to go. And that's why it says that he obeyed and went out because he was obeying the command. You see, going is a command. If God tells us to go... In many different ways, we are called. For example, we are called to go and preach the gospel, aren't we? And the Bible says in Mark 16, He said unto them, "Go, ye, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature." Again, that's not a that's not an option. That's not something that Jesus just said, "Hey, if you feel like it," or you know, when you when it's convenient you for you. I've heard some people with this lifestyle evangelism go so far as to say, "Well, it says when He said go, what He means is as you live your life. That's what it means to go. As you're just going through this life, you know." Witness to those people that you come in contact with. That's, that's, a, that's a bunch of hogwash. Jesus said that we are to go. Go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not just those people that we bump into. Not to those people that we have an influence in our life. Of course we should try and witness to those people as well. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that God often tells His people to go. He tells them to go out and do something. If you're Hebrews 11, uh, bookmark it. But just turn back to uh, Hebrews 10, one chapter. We are called to go out. God puts the command for us to go in different instances. You know, the, the, there's the the, call, the command to go preach the gospel. There's also the command to go to church. If you think about it, we're here this morning because that's a commandment that we have to do. We have to fulfill that. God has called us to go to church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the Bible reads, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, what is the assembling of, our, of ourselves together? That's the church. That's us coming together and hearing the preaching of the Word of God for, and, and praying and, and, and assembling as a church. And he's saying they're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. <coughs> Excuse me. Now that assembling of ourselves together, of course that's a church. You know, you have to go to church. You know, that's, you, you can't assemble together without somebody having, without having to go to, uh, to, to a place. Not everybody's always living together, of course, right? That's pretty obvious. So there's the commandment that we have to go to church. We have to go soul winning. God puts a command on us to go. Now, what I want to preach about this morning is the fact that, you know, that's the title of the sermon, is called to go. We've seen that we've called to preach the gospel. We've seen that we're called to go to church. And, and speaking, kind of building off that point of being called to go to church, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that sometimes in order to be in a good church, you're going to have to move. That's really what I want. That's the thrust of the message is talking about moving to be in a good church. Because that's something that people have to deal with today. That's something that a lot of people have to consider when, when, when we're looking at our nation and our country and people that want to serve God with their lives and, and do things for God and do great things. They have to consider where they're at, you know, geographically, physically, in this world, in this nation, in this country. And they have to consider whether or not it just might be that God might put a call in their life.
to go. And I don't say that lightly. I don't just throw that out there. It's just a, an attempt to get people to, to, you know, to build up a church or something like that, or to just, you know, forsake their, 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 their uh, the place that they've grown up, their friends and their family. That's a big thing to ask people to do. We have to understand something that, that, and I really want to drive in, is that the importance of going to a good church and why it is that we need to go to a good church. Of course, the best option is to bloom where you're planted, right? That's what I was always told when I was in other churches. You know, the, the pastor would just say, just bloom where you're planted. And that's a great thing. If you can, if you can bloom where you're planted, but here's the thing, in order, in order to bloom, you've got to have some good soil, right? Plants just don't bloom, you know, on a, on a, a slab of concrete. They don't just bloom, you know, on a hard pack ground with no with uh, you know soil devoid of any nutrients you have to if you're gonna bloom where you're planted well where you're planted has to be you know capable of, of nurturing you and helping you to bloom so that's something to consider and really it's important because we, we know there's the importance of the local church I mean that's what Christ you know Christ died for, to save sinners and he and he commanded us to go to church the local church is God's vehicle to reach the the, the world with the gospel that's how important the New Testament church is it's not something to be taken lightly. You know, people take church very lightly. There's so many different types of churches. There's so many different brands and kinds of churches. Even within a Baptist denomination, if you want to call it that, there's people that are, you know, all different stripes and, and types of churches. But that doesn't, you know, and people kind of get a, uh, they get jaded or they just kind of take it for granted. They'll just say, well, there's all these different churches. There's a church in every corner. You know, what's, what's wrong with any church? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about here in a minute, but I want to just drive the, the, the point that, the local church is important. That we need to be in a good church. That's why uh, uh, the Apostle Paul told Titus, he said, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should have set, set in order the things that are wanting, and ordained elders in every city as I appointed. Of course, the elders, the pastor, the bishop. So what he's saying here, Paul is telling him, he says, I want churches in every city. I mean, that's how important it is to God that every one of his children, every believer has a church to go to. That he wants a church built in every city. That he would actually... Uh, desire that men would be sent out, ordained, and to start churches in every city. And wouldn't it God that were the case in our country, that people wouldn't have to consider moving, that people wouldn't have to think about leaving the place that they're familiar with, or the, or the place that they've grown accustomed to and enjoy, where they're comfortable, and have to move to some other strange place that they've never been to, and, re and learn a whole other city, and, 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 and uh, develop new friendships, and all these things like that. Would to God that we could have a church in every city, in the world, and in this and in this country, but that's just not the case. We don't. That's not. That's not what we see. That's God's will, but unfortunately, man has fallen short of accomplishing that goal. You know, the ideal situation is that everyone has a good to, a good church to go to where they are. But if they don't, they're going to have to consider the fact that they might be called to go. Now, if there are a lot of good churches out there, and I think, and sometimes on the on the on the flip side of this coin, some people are real quick and eager to just forsake the, the assembly, the local assembly, and they'll have a lot of criticisms of a church and say, well, I have to go to these, or move to one of these other churches. Well, well, they could probably do all right where they're at. You know, um, we talk about deal breakers here. You know, what are, what are some deal breakers for, for a local church? It might be that you're sitting, you know, maybe somebody out there in Internet land, or, or if we might find ourselves in another situation in the future where we're in another city or another state where we have to say, well, what I have to go to a church, I have to pick out a church. What should or shouldn't I look for? Well, you should probably look for somebody that uses the King James Bible. I mean, that's that's the foundational thing. If they're not using the King James Bible, that's an instant deal breaker. I don't, they, you know, if they're using an NIV or ESV or any one of these versions, any other thing than the preserved Word of God in English, the King James Bible, you know, that's a deal breaker. We can't go to that church. They don't have the right. They don't have the right seed. You know, the, anything that's going to bloom there is going to be corrupt. They don't preach. They have to be make sure that they're preaching the correct salvation. And this is something, you know, you can't just go on a doctrinal statement and, and get a, and, and get a uh, good beat on this. Right. A lot of times you actually have to go to that church, you know, and start to talk to the people, talk to the pastor, talk to those in leadership to find out what exactly is it that you guys believe about salvation. Because, every, you know, nobody's just going to come out and say, hey, yeah, we believe it's by works. You know, the Catholic Church doesn't believe it by works. They, they won't say it's by works, but they teach it's by works. Nobody wants to just come out and say, hey, it's by works. Especially an independent, fundamental Baptist church. You know, a Baptist pastor, of all people, is, you know, is it, knows the importance of saying the words, yeah, it's by, it's salvation is by grace through faith. They know that that's something that people want to hear. That that's what they, they're looking for. But they've got all these different, these strange doctrines that they developed, all these new beliefs and all these things that they're, they're, they're mixing in with the gospel, especially this thing of repent of your sins. They're trying to tell people now that, oh yeah, it's salvation by grace through faith. 
But if there's no change in your life, if you don't repent of these sins, well, you probably didn't get the real thing. Well, either you believed or you didn't. Either you put your faith on, tr on trust in Christ or you didn't. And it has nothing to do with your works. And that's a whole other salvation or a whole other message in, in, in and of itself. But that's one of the deal breakers, right? The King James Bible, it's got to be there. Salvation by grace through faith, it's got to be there. What's another kind? Of, what might be another deal breaker? And for me, this is kind of this is kind of you got to feel this one out a little bit. There's some wiggle room here, but they got to have some kind of an outreach. You know, that's important. They got to be a type of church. You know, and if they don't have this, you know, personally, I, I would probably I'd be a little bit more lenient. I could try to do my own soul winning and, 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 and try to do my own outreach, even if a church didn't, as long as it was approved by the pastor. Now, if it's a pastor who's saying, you know, you can't do that. You can't go out on behalf of our church and, and try to preach the gospel to people. Well, that, that's a guy whose heart's just isn't right. He probably doesn't have salvation right at that point. I mean, if you understand and know salvation, that people are dying and going to hell, and that Christ died for all the world, and all they have to do is believe, and all it requires is somebody to go and preach to them, why wouldn't you want that? So that would be another deal breaker, perhaps, and something to look out for. Do they have any kind of an outreach? Do they have some kind of a ministry, something where they're trying to get go out into the lost and, and to, to minister to them? Now, those are minimal requirements. I think that's setting the bar pretty low, but that's a pretty important bar. You wouldn't want to go any lower than that, right? Now, when you're when you're meeting these requirements, you know, yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty low requirement, and, and you have to ask yourself. Is that what we want for our life? Do we want to just meet the minimum requirements? And I think there's a lot of people that are out there right now, that's what they're doing. They're meeting the minimum requirements. Like, hey, it's King James. He's got salvation right. They got a bus ministry, or we go on visitation. We get an hour of soul winning a week. You know, there's a time appointed for it. That's great, and I'm glad there's something out there that you can, you can attend to, or attend, a church you can go to that, that meets those requirements. But you got to think about the fact that that's setting the bar pretty low. I mean, those are just basic standards. That should just be common. That should just be in every church. That should even be a question. And when you're trying to meet these requirements, you know, you have to ask yourself, it's one thing when it's just you, when you're just a single individual and it's just one person and you're going to that church and you're meeting the minimum requirements, you know, you're the only person really that's being directly affected in your family. But what about when, you're, when, you, when you get married and your family starts to grow? What about your spouse? You know, especially with wives, you know. When, the, when people are taking their wives to these churches that, you know, we've, we've talked about these minimum requirements, but what about when they, they have a nursery? You know, and they want, they want your, your wife to, uh, to hand over the kids, you know, or, or your wife, you know, the, the Bible it, um, lays down some pretty strict guidelines for women, you know, and men too. But uh, and there's some things that women really struggle with in scriptures, or at least they can. Uh, some do, you know, with the, with the dress standards and keeping, being keepers at home, things that are a direct conflict with what the world you know, these, especially if your wife is somebody who got saved later in life, and now they've got to make these decisions for whether or not they're going to live for God, and those would involve, you know, not getting out of the workforce. And they're going to have all these worldly influences, all these friends and family saying, wait, what are you doing? Why are you dressing like that? Why are you going to church all the time? What do you mean you're staying at home with the kids? Why don't you just put them in public school? You know, people don't want to hear about it, you know, in the world when you, when you start to have, you know, because raising a, a family on a, on a single income can be a, a little bit of a struggle sometimes. And a lot of times, and I've had people do this to me and say, well, why don't you just put your wife to work? Why don't you just, you know, they don't really have a lot of, you know, uh, sympathy or understanding for you because they just, they're like, well, just do what we're doing. Just put your kids in a public education system and send your wife out there and, and, and put her to work. And, and uh, they don't really think that through. And of course, the Bible says that women are to be keepers at home, that they are to love their father, to love their husbands, love their children, that they're to be good and obedient, and they're supposed to stay at home and raise the family. And that's a big job. That's a very important job. That's something that's, undervalued in our society. Yeah. But when you ask your wife to do that, and then you're taking to a church that, yeah, it meets the minimum requirements, but doesn't have a lot of ladies that have that same mindset. There aren't a lot of like-minded women in that church. It's going to be very hard for her, you know, to do, I mean, she's, of course she's going to do, if she has any integrity, she's just going to do it out of obedience to the Word of God. But it, it sure would make it easier if she had some support. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a good reason to consider moving to a good church, is to find support for your wife. Find some kind of, get your wife plugged in into a church where there's a, a culture, where there's of people there of, of like-minded ladies. I mean, you think here at Faithful Word, all the ladies that we have that stay at home, that are great examples that women can, other women and wives and, and uh, mothers can go to for help and guidance because we're just surrounded by them. You know, and talking about your wives, well, what about your children? It's meeting the minimum requirements in your local church is what, what's best for your children. 
I mean, you think, I mean, I know the church we left, you know, there was, I mean, children were very rare. You know, if they weren't being carted in on the bus route, you know, Wednesday night when there was no bus route running, or Sunday night when there was no bus route running, there were very few children there. You know, a lot of a lot of these Baptist churches now they're they're teaching their people, hey, only use birth control, only have one or two kids. You know, and then, and those kids are growing up quick. And the kids that we did have in churches, I've seen so many of them just go to the devil. They just go out, they go to the world, they don't live, they don't live for God. They just they just take on the things of the world as soon as they're eighteen and they're out the door. You know, they they run off into the world. Not all of them, but the majority of them do. Now you have to ask yourself: Is that the example that you want to set for your children? Do you want to bring your children up? In a church that, yeah, meets the minimum requirements, but there's hardly any children there. The ones that are there, they go to the devil, or they're very worldly, or they're, they're, uh, you know, they're of course their moms at work, so they're, they're, you're putting them there with kids that are, you know, going to public uh, school system. They've got all these these influences in their lives, and you want them being an influence on your children. And a lot of people say, well, no, I don't. So what they end up doing is just isolating their kids within that church. So now you just have a very, you know, you're just isolating kids. They really don't have any other friends. And that's a great thing about going to a church like ours, is that there's so many kids. People are having children. I mean, our children growing up, they're going to have so many options when it comes time to get married. When you think about it, that's a, that's a great thing. That's an important thing to think about. And that they're going to have so, they're going to see so many godly examples of other children being raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and, and continuing to live for God even as they uh, turn into young adults. So meeting the minimum requirements, it's a low bar. And what you're, and it's, it might be one thing if you're a single individual and you can suffer through that and say, hey, you know what, I'm probably get, not going to get everything I need out of this church. But when you're, especially as a man, when you're now putting your wife in that situation and your children, you have to start to ask yourself, it might just be that I'm being called to go. There might be better for me to go. Because here's the thing, and one of the, one of the thoughts that uh, I had when I decided to move is this thought that I read in a book, I can't remember which one it was, but the, the, it was written by a pastor, and he said this, your children will be what you are, you will be what your church is, and your church will be what your pastor is. So when you look at the man of God, you, can, you, you might as well say, well, the man of God, you know, through the church, through me, is going to be what my children are. So, if you, you know, you have to consider that. What type of church are you in? What type of pastor do you have? What type of Christian are you going to be? That's what's going to affect your children. So we're meeting the minimum requirements. You know, we're going to a King James church. You know, we're we're uh, we're we're there. Where they have some kind of an outreach. They they preach. They got salvation right, and we're meeting the requirements. But what are they? Are they accomplishing great works for God? I mean, I, I mean, that's another reason to perhaps move. Another reason why God might call somebody to go is that there's a great work to be done. And then and when we pool our resources together, when more people are come together in one place. And there's more uh, man, uh, man hours, there's more uh, manpower there to go out and do the work. There's more financial resources, there's just more volunteers to be able to do things. When we can accomplish greater things for God, we have more people. Great things, of course, can be accomplished through, through, um, through smaller groups. I mean, compar by comparison, Faithful Word, when you compare our church to some of the mega churches out there, I mean, we're just a drop in the bucket. But what are those churches accomplishing for God? I mean, genuine works for God. Souls being saved for eternity. It's very little by a comparison. So the more of us there are, the greater work that we can do. That might be another reason why God might call us to go, is that He has a greater work for us to do. Now, being called to go and saying, you know what, I, I know I'm in a decent church, I could, I could do well here, but I could do even better in another one. And here's the thing, you know, you, you've got all these options now. I know when we went to move, it was like, it was two churches. You know, we opted for faithful word. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're glad we, that, that, that we did, we love it here. But now the people today, man, you, you could pick your climate practically these days. You know, you, you got, you've got options. You could go to Florida, to Steadfast. Right? Not, right. That, not that trash can. You could go to, you know, you could go to Dallas, Fort Worth. You got two places in California, you, you know, if that's, if that's not your style, well, you could go all the way up to, to Vancouver and Washington. We've got one coming up in Atlanta. I know I'm forgetting some. you got Violet, Louisiana, another one in Baton Rouge. You've got one out in Illinois if you're, if you're out there in the Midwest. And just and, there, I know there's others, and, and I'm forgetting. I mean, you've got, what, two in Texas and a third one coming up, and you've got options today. You've got probably a dozen options, if not more. You've got one in North Carolina. All these great churches of our stripe. That, that preach the whole counsel of God, that don't hold back, that are emphasize soul winning, that, that emphasize having children, that want to do a great work for God, that would be great churches that you could go and you really could bloom there because the soil is good. And, and, and people have got a lot of great options today. But um, 
you know, if you're going to do that, if you're going to make that move, well, it requires some substance to do it. It's easy to get fired up and say, yeah, I want to do that. And, I, and I've known people that have been fired up and they've wanted to move for a long time, but it took them a, it took them a while. Because in order, to be, in order to answer that call to go, it's going to take some substance. It has to be tangible. It has to have some weight. There has to be some, some merit behind it. There has to be some gravity to it. You know, you have to really feel that need to go. And when you start to feel that, you know, you'll start to make a plan. That's the first step in getting, when you're, when you're called to go, you have to make a plan. Now, we saw Abraham here. There wasn't much of a plan. He was just basically told to go. And, he, and the Bible says he went into a land where he knew not. But there was still a plan, wasn't there? I'm sure he had to, you know, figure, well, we're about to leave. We're never coming back. We don't know where we're going. They had to figure out what they were going to need, gather the supplies, get everything together. It wasn't just like... God told him that he rolled out of the bed the next day and just started and walked out as the front door of his tent and walked. Now he had to pack up the tent, get everything together. So you have to make a plan where you're going to go. You have to make a plan. The Bible says in Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law happy is he. See, when we don't have the vision, that's when you're going to perish. If you just say, you know, I, I know we should go. I just don't know how to do it. I don't know where I want to go. I don't, I don't know when I'm going to get there. If you don't have a vision, if you don't have a plan, you're going to perish. Eventually, you're just going to say, yeah, if you keep putting it off, one day I'll go, one day I'll get in one of these good churches, one day when, when everything's just right, when the finances are perfect, when I've got everything lined up and all my ducks in a row, then I'll make the move. When everything's just secure and sound and I can make it, you know, you, well, that might never happen. Right. That might never happen. You, you might never make it. I know when we moved, you know, there was some planning, but it was pretty minimal. I mean, and, and finances was not a huge part of it. I mean, it was... Do we have enough to get the vehicle there? And, and, and we did. And I was like, well, then that's good enough. That's our plan, right? We were probably a little bit more on the Abrahamic side of a move, right? Where it was just like, we don't know where we're going. We're not going to know what we're going to find when we get there. Um, we know we've got an apartment, a one-bedroom apartment waiting, and the, the, the tires still got enough tread to get us there. So let's just do it, right? But we had it. We, that's because there was some substance to it. We were able to do that because it was, there was some weight there. You know, we, we had been in this church, some things had happened there where we realized this is not the place for us anymore. This isn't what we want to do with our lives. This isn't how we want to raise our family. And you hear about this great church that started up out in Phoenix and has been in, in, in functioning for several years. And really the draw for us wasn't just the preaching, but it was the soul winning. Yeah. It was, it was a, there was a pastor that was wanting people to go out and knock the doors and preach the, the gospel. And of course there were some issues with, with doctrine requiring salvation. And that was another, that was the, the main reason. But boy, I mean, we could have found other churches in the area that had salvation dead on and gone there. But there would have been these other things. You know, we probably could have been all right there. But there was a church somewhere that wanted to preach the gospel to every preacher. They wanted to fulfill that commandment. And that's what, that's what motivated us to make a plan and get out there. You have to make a plan. You have to set a date. You have to say, this is when we're going to go. We're going to do it. And that's when you'll start to make things happen. The Bible says in James, uh, go, go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanish the way. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. Of course, we don't want to just be found boasting ourselves and saying, oh yeah, I'll talk about all the great things that we're going to do. But if the Lord will, if the Lord called us to go, then we can say, you know what? We have we can set a date. We can say, the Lord will, we will be there this time, you know, uh, in, in these following months or, or the, within this time next year. You have to set a date. You have to provide for the plan. You have to provide for the plan. You can't just make the plan. You've got to provide for it, right? You have to find out what is needed and you got to fund it. You've got to get the resources together. Not only that, you've got to make a plan. You've got to provide for the plan to move. Then you've got to execute the plan. It's not enough to have everything ready to know what to do. You've got the, everything laid out. You've got the maps marked. You've got... The hotels you're going to stop to on the way there. You've got, you know, you know what, where all the cracker barrels are along the route or whatever. You know, you've got all your money together, and uh, you've got, you know, exactly how, to, how long it's going to take you, how much gas you're going to need, you know, how much you, you've got all these things in place. But until you actually put the keys in the ignition and back that thing out of the driveway and start making your way down the road, it's never going to happen. You have to do what it takes to execute the plan. So it requires, if you're called to go, if if you say, you know, I want to move to a good church, it's going to require. A plan. It's going to require that you put some weight into it, and it's going to require some sincerity. And I really kind of want to take a minute. And I talked a little bit about this last week with with some other things, but I think this is just something that's been in my heart and mind lately. Um, 
for some old, my own personal reasons, but also just because of some of the things we've seen in our own church lately, that people are, are doing, uh, making just terrible decisions with their lives. And I think a lot of times it's because of the motivations of their heart. Yeah. We're finally starting to see what the, their true motives are in their heart. And that's something that we have to really be careful and examine our, in our own selves. You know, especially when it comes to this topic of moving. You know, why is it that you want to go? Why do you want to go to another church? Why would somebody want to go and pack up their family and leave all their familiar friends and family behind and go and, and start a, a life over in another city? It requires some sincerity. Your motives have to be sincere if you're going to. Go ahead and uh, bookmark uh, Hebrews 11. But turn over to Philippians. Philippians, you have to be sincere in your motivations if you're going to move. If you're called to go, you know, obviously God... And I'm, when I say when you're called to go, I'm not saying like, you know, you're waking up with a vision in the night and God, you know, God's speaking to you as He did to Abraham. You know, obviously it's just you're seeing the situation that you're in, what's the potential, you understand these things, you're saying, hey, there's a call for me to go. I'm not saying that God's literally calling you to go. <clears throat> but in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, uh, beginning in verse 1, if there be therefore, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Those ought to be the motivations that we have. Because we, we not out of strife or vainglory, not because we want to go to church and try to get on the camera or get our name mentioned from the pulpit or be involved in some way publicly so that our name can be out there. Because the thing is, you know, there's a lot of people that watch. There's a lot of people that watch uh, the preaching online. There's a lot of people that pay attention. I mean, people are showing up at church. I, mean, I went to that soul winning conference in Detroit, and I was blown away by how many people knew me. Yeah. They're like, oh, hey, you're Brother Corbin. I'm like, yeah, I'm real. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I kind of, I, I, whenever it happens to me, I flash back to when I moved here. And I came up to Pastor Burgess back then. He was just, you know, Brother Dave Burgess just before he got set out. And I just remember like, oh, I know who you are. And I had that same kind of just like this off, starstruck, just like, wow, you're real. And it was just kind of an awkward moment with him. He's like, yeah, we're real. You know, we're flesh and blood here. You know, I remember getting here and seeing all the people I, I recognized even before I got to church so in our neighborhood I'd say hey that's so and so and hey that's so -and -so. I recognize the back of that person's head from the video and, <laughs> and it, you know and now I have that happening to me but the thing is I didn't move out here so that I could you know so I could get on a camera right. you know I didn't move out here so people would recognize me and know my name at Faithful Word but that's what I think a lot of people they need to they need to sincerely ask themselves if that's why they're moving because I think some people it, it just might be that they're following you know, they want to go out there just to be part of of, of, uh, of, the, of the group that, that they can get their, their name out there. But the Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. And it's that vainglory that they're seeking. And then it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That ought to be the motive for wanting to go to a good church, of being willing to say, hey, you know, I'm going to move my family. Why? Because you're going to look on the, not on your own things, but on the things of your wife, the things of your children. The things of those that are uh, that you're going to come into contact with when you get here, they want to be a blessing to the church. And I just want to move. And I'm, I'm so thankful for. I mean, we've seen our church just grow in the six short years that I've been here. I mean, when we got here, we hadn't even broken 100 in the attendance record. And six years later, you know, we're running close to 300 every Sunday morning, if not more. And the, the building's just expanded, and I believe it's going to continue to grow. And it's been such a blessing. And I'm just thankful for all the people that have come out here, and they've come out for the right reasons. They didn't. They don't care about getting behind a pulpit. They don't care about you know, whether or not they lead the songs or read the music or read the, the scripture or get their face somewhere, somewhere recognized. They just want to be here for the right reasons. Their motives are right and true. They want to be a blessing. They want God's best for their life. They want to help others. They want to help their family. And they want to do the soul winning. They're, there, they're here for the right reason. They're here for their own spiritual well-being. That's the motive that we have to move for. The spiritual well-being of yourself, of your family, of the other people in the church, the spiritual well-being of those that you will reach with the gospel. I mean, that's the, I think that's the biggest motivation for anybody to move. I think that's probably one of the biggest draws that people want to come to Faith Awards. They say, look at all the soul winning they're doing. I mean, we're going to Aruba, we're going to Sonora, Mexico. We're, you know, I, I, to sit up here and try to recall all the places we've been in the last couple of years, it would, it would be, it would be a chore to try to think. I mean, we just got had guys come back from Belize or Guatemala or something. I can't even remember somewhere in Belize. South America. I mean, yeah, Belize. We just, we've been everywhere. 
And people see that and they say, hey, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. They say, I want to go, I want to be part of that soul winning. I want to be part of a church that's doing something for God. And there's other great churches out there that are doing other great things. You know, I think about Steadfast and sending all these guys up to the Pine Ridge. I, I believe they're there even today. And thank God for that. I mean, there's all these great churches. I mean, we've got varied, all the, you know, it can go on and on. All these great churches that want to just do the soul winning. Why don't you move to one of those churches? Why don't you pick one out that you like and, and, and move to those churches and do something big for God. Why? For your own spiritual well-being, for the spiritual well-being of your family, for the spiritual well-being of those that you'll get saved. Not because you desire vain glory. Not to be part of a club. People need to ask themselves, why do they want to move? Is it because you want to follow a man? Is it because you want to, you want to follow a man or a movement? You want to be a part of something? Or is it just because you want to be associated with someone? It's because you want to be a part of something bigger. Not just because you're drawn to one particular individual. So we see it requires you know you to make a plan. It requires you to make sure that you're if you're called to go that you have the right you have a plan. You know there's you feel the weight, the merit, the the gravity of it. It has to have some substance. It has to have some sincerity. But not only that, it's going to require sincerity. It's going to require substance. It's going to require sacrifice. And this is really where I think people, this is the part that people really choke on. You know they they their, their motives are right. They they have a plan. They they know they could get there. But then they start to understand something that it's going to come at a cost. That being called to go can come at a cost. That it's going to cost you some things. Turn back over to Hebrews 11 if you kept something there. Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, there's, in this chapter we see people that 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 were that that, uh, that cost them some things in order to be called of God, to be obedient to the call of God. You think about Moses here in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect and the recompense of reward. So we see that, you know, he kind of had it made. He could have stayed there and he could have lived in Egypt and probably had a pretty, enjoy, as it says, enjoyed the pleasures of sin for his season. You know, he was Pharaoh's, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, he was in a high position in the land. He probably would have had the best food. You know, all, all those great things, all the luxuries and the conveniences that that life would have afforded him. But he forsook those things. And you say, well, that's not much of a sacrifice. Maybe not, but it was definitely a temptation. It was definitely something that was tempting him to keep him there. And it was something that he had to put on the altar and say, you know what, I'm willing to give this up. And that's why it says, by faith he forsook Egypt. He's saying, you know, I forsake all these things. And I've heard other testimonies of other people, and, and, and when they decided that they were going to make a move, that's when, that's when all the offers started to come in. Well, hey, we'll double your salary. Hey, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. Just stick around. Just stay here. And, and, and don't go. You know, the, the job offer might come in. Or the, 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 the opportunity to, to do whatever, some some great opportunity that would keep you from joining a good church, maybe for fulfilling the, the, the call that God has for you to go out and, and to and to do help be a part of a of a great movement. People might you know they might say, Well, you know what, I don't want to sacrifice this. I don't want to give this up. If you're going to to answer the call to go, you're gonna to have to understand that it might require a sacrifice that's going to come at a cost. We're there in Hebrews eleven, look. At verse 37, it talks about these people who aren't even mentioned by name. It says that they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Now that does sound like Phoenix, doesn't it? So, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the summer months, afflicted, tormented, yeah, a little bit. They wandered about in, uh, in deserts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Phoenix. And in mountains, Phoenix. And in dens and in caves of the earth, you know, when it gets really hot, you got to stay in the den, you got to stay in the cave of the earth, you got to stay in that apartment, you got to stay in the house, you got to keep the AC on. You know, we can really relate to these people here in Phoenix, can we? And these all having a good report uh, through faith received not the promise. Of course, I'm joking around there. I mean, these people really did make a sacrifice. These things really did happen. Why did they do that? Why did they wander? They, they were wandering about. I mean, you think about Abraham. They go, oh, wow, what an exciting life. Yeah, life living in a tent. Life spent your whole life raising your family in a tent, wandering about in some strange land, not receiving the promise. You know, knowing that, hearing God make all these promises. Hey, one day your your seed's going to be as the stars in heaven, as the sand in the sea. All all the land that your foot treads upon is going to be, you know, it's going to be uh, your your children are going to inherit it. You know, that's that's a great promise, but it's it's another thing to to, to live it out, to flesh that out in this life when you're living in a tent. You know, Abraham was somebody who made a great sacrifice, somebody who was willing to. To, to pay the cost to follow God to go, and that's a and that's something that we might have to to consider. Now I don't you know thank God here in, in America 
we're not wandering about in goatskins and sheepskins, and we're not tormented and afflicted. I mean, we got it pretty easy. And it's amazing the things that people will let them hold them back from fulfilling the call to go. They'll say, well, you know, I just can't, I can't find a job that's going to pay me that extra five or $10,000 a month. Well, can, can you cut something out? Can you, can you make a little bit of a sacrifice here? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, you know, I just don't know. I, I, I can't find my, you know, four bedroom, three bath house that I need. Well, what about an apartment? Can you make do with an apartment for a little while until you find that house? And I'm thinking about a family who just moved here recently. You know, they, they wanted to be here so bad, they were willing to move like practically 45 minutes to an hour out of town away from the church just to get started. You know, and then that's, that's, that, now that's, a, that's a, not a huge sacrifice, but it's something, that's something that somebody else might let hinder them. Well, you know, if I can't be within 20 minutes of church, what's the point? I don't want, I don't want to do all that driving every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's pretty weak. You know, that's, that's, some, that's some weak sauce right there. You need to, you, need to uh, you know, man up a little bit about that kind of a thing and say, look, it might come as a sacrifice. And, and, but look what these people did. I mean, we're not even close to having to do anything that they did. Mm -hmm. Not even close. I mean, it would be a joke to try and compare anything, anything that we've sacrificed. I mean, I remember I, one of the great sacrifices that I had to make to move out here. I had to sell, I had to sell my, my, my computer. <laughs> oh, man. It was like cutting off an arm, right? <laughs> what a great sacrifice that I made. I, I sold my goods. I had to leave a lot of things back in Michigan, and, you know. I had to leave all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's nothing. What if I were to get to heaven and go to Abraham? Well, you know what I did, Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> or I went to these people and said, well, you know, I understand what you did, you know, with, with being the tortured and imprisoned, sawn asunder. You know, I sold a Mac. <laughs> it's a joke, right? But some people, that's their mentality. They don't, they don't understand the sacrifice that might be required of them. They just want the, the, the smooth, easy path. They want God to just wave a magic wand and cause everything just to fall right into place. Well, sometimes it doesn't work like that. Sometimes God might even let things get in your way a little bit just to kind of test your metal, to see what you're made of, to see what, what it's going to take to stop you. And that's what I've heard said is the test of a, of a person's character is what it takes to stop them. What's going to keep you from accomplishing that thing that you ought to do for God? What's going to stop you from, from living for God? That's how we, how we know what you're made of. You know, to be in the will of God, you just might have to get a little uncomfortable. You might have to, you might have to deal with a little discomfort in order to answer the call to go to be in the will of God. You know, it, it might not be the ideal situ, situation, uh, but you know, but again, how does it compare to what we just read with Abraham and, and Isaac and, and Moses and these, these strangers that we, we read about? Now, you know, we, we talk about making a sacrifice in order to be in the will of God, and we talk about these individuals here in Hebrews 11, and we see the great sacrifice that they made, but, you know, there's somebody else that did something similar. You know, there's, there's another person who was willing to be a little uncomfortable. There was somebody else who was willing to go and do something for somebody else that had the right motivations, that wasn't seeking his own glory, that wanted to go out and do something for God, that wanted to accomplish God's will, and he was willing to make a sacrifice. And that person is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people who are, are, are on the fence, and they're him on, and you know, their they're, they're family's suffering, and they know they need to get, get in a good church, whether it's here at Faithful Word or another church that's close to them, or they need to move. You know, there's probably even good churches that we don't even know about that a person might need to move like an hour in one direction. They might need to move 45 minutes in one direction in order to maybe make that move a little, uh, make that, that trip to that church a little easier, to be a little bit more faithful to church. But they, they don't want to do it because it's, it's just too much to ask. You know, but, but we need to consider him who endured such contradiction, contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we be weary in our minds and faint. You know, we have not suffered unto blood striving against sin as Jesus Christ did. People need to stop and consider the move that Jesus made for them. Think about the fact that Jesus made a move for you. That Jesus left heaven. He left glory. He left the, uh, you know, the, all the, the throne and came down and was uh, man, you know, came, became flesh, was born of a virgin. He lived, a, he lived that life, tempted in all points, like as, as we are, yeah, without sin. They, oh, he was God. It must have been easy for him. It must, I mean, that's, a, that's, a pretty, that's, that's stooping pretty low when you're God. To say, hey, I'm going to come all the way down and be born in a manger. Not a palace. You know, he wasn't born in some, some, some luxurious place. There wasn't, you know, all these people just heralding his birth and just making sure he's pampered and taken care of. He's born in a manger. You know, a, a trough where they feed cattle. He's born out in the barn. You ever been in a barn? It's not exactly the most sanitary place to, to give birth. But that's where he was born. That's where the, where the king of, of glory was born. He came down here. He made a move for us, didn't he? And he stuck around, and he, and, he, and he endured a lot of sacrifice, and he made a lot of, uh, went through a lot of hardships. 
But what if he made the same excuse as some of us did? That we don't want to be in the will of God. And it might be, you know, you know, a person such as myself and others that, that will come after me and others that are even in the same position I'm in now to think about, well, you know, there's a great need to go start churches. There's a great need for people to, to leave a great church and go start a great church. But we can start to come up with a lot of excuses, couldn't we? And say, you know, I don't want to make that move. I don't want to take that chance. I don't want to take the risk. I don't want to put myself out there because, you know, there's, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. Or, or things aren't, aren't, aren't lined up just right. But what if Jesus had that same excuse? When the Father said, hey, I need to send somebody to go and die for the world to pay for their sins, just see, Jesus said, well, you know, I, I would like to do it, but, you know, it's just too much. Sorry, I just can't do that. You know, I don't want to deal with that discomfort. I don't want to have to make that sacrifice. That we, We'd all be in a pretty bad situation, wouldn't we? Sorry. But we need to have that same mindset, you know, and consider that anything that we're going to do for God in this life you know, is nothing compared to not only what others have done, but what Jesus did for us. And, uh, and stop making all the excuses. Hebrews 11, look at verse 13. <laughs> the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were strangers and pilgrims. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek country, and truly if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. You know, people get real hung up about where they're going to go live. You know, people got and, and people say, Well, I want to I want to go, you know, I want to attend church in this city, or I want to go start a church here. It's got to be this type of weather and stuff like that. And that's fine. I mean, we're, we can definitely we have the uh, the luxury of having options and preference and, 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 and you know, letting our preferences kind of guide us. But, you know, at the same time, you know, none of those things really matter. And if God calls us to go to a place that might not be ideal, God calls us to a place that some people would say, why in the world would you want to go there? Why would you want to go to a place like that? Why would, for a church, why would you want to go to, you know, when we were moving out to Phoenix, you know what I heard over and over again? It's hot there. Yeah. It's hot there. It's like, yeah, I know. And I turn, when I got here, guess what? It turns out they're right. It's hot. <laughs> you know, and it's dry, and it's brown, and it's dusty. There's a lot of great things about Phoenix and Arizona, but there's a lot of drawbacks, too. A lot of people would say, why are you moving there? You know, but well, I'll tell you why. I'd move there. I'd move to Philadelphia. I'd move to, you know, Atlanta. I'd move to any one of these cities for a good church if I needed to. Because I'm a stranger. Because I'm a pilgrim. Because this world is not my home. Yeah. Because I'm just, you know, passing through, as the song says. You know, that I'm seeking a, a heavenly city. That I know that's my final destination. The, the, the foundations of which the, the builder and maker is God. You know, when you start to consider that, that this life is just a vapor, that it's just fleeting. You know, whatever sacrifices we have to make, whatever discomfort we might have to go through, wherever we might have to leave, live in order to be a good church that might not be ideal to us, might not be meet all of our personal preferences, you know, those things are pale in comparison to glory. If we let that, if, if, you know, if, if, we, uh, if we embrace that promise as they did, and if we, if we are allow that to persuade us, if we allow the fact that we are going to inherit a heavenly Jerusalem with Christ, like we're going to dwell in a mansion, mansion that Christ has made for us, you know, we could start to let these things, these discomforts, they, they don't seem so uncomfortable anymore. These preferences, you know, they don't seem so important. That's why the Bible says in, in, in 1 Peter, he said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. You know, this lust that we have, these desires, in order, I got to have this job and this city and have this house and have all these preferences that are going to war against our soul and keep us out of a good church. You know, you need to be more of a stranger. You need to make yourself more of a pilgrim. Somebody who's just going to wander through this life, wander through this land and, and inherit the promise. You say, well, that's not easy. Well, no, it's not easy. And, and it's hard to, you know, to say, it's easy to get up and just say, yeah, well, you know, you're going to heaven one day and, and, and you're going to live there, so you should, none of this here on earth should, should matter. You know, you shouldn't be so hung up on, on all these, these uh, earthly, you know, um, earthly uh, uh, trivialities and things like that. It's easy to say that, right? I mean, it was easy for God to just tell Abraham, hey, go. Uh, you need to go. It was easy for God to say it, right? Didn't, I mean, God, God knew the beginning from the end. But if, you know, if we're going to see it through, if we're going to do it, we have to be by Abraham. You know, Abraham obeyed, but how did he do it? By faith. Right? That's what we see in this chapter. By faith, by faith, by faith. 
If we're going to do it, we're going to have to do it like Abraham. We're going to have to obey the call to go. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to do it by faith. And that's the message this morning, you know, is that we need to consider where we're at spiritually, you know, and physically in this world. And if it's if it's anything less than than, than you know what would, what God would have us doing, then we need to consider moving. We need to say, hey, there might be a call for me to go. You know, maybe we're doing we're doing good in a church, but what if we could do ten times better than another? I mean, that that's I mean, if, if living the Christian life is what's important, if being fruitful and abounding in Christ is what's important, then being in a great church is very important. And it's great if people can find something where they're at. And and, and honestly, that's would to God there was more of that, that people could just find a church where they're at. But if not, it might be that God has called us to go. And we have to be willing to make a plan. We're willing to execute it. We're going to be willing to sacrifice. And we're going to have to do it all by faith. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, whatever, whatever is not a faith um, you know, is not pleasing to God. So let's make sure our motivations are right. And let's make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. And it might be that you know, one day we're in a great church now, but maybe one day God will, will want us to go somewhere else and start a great church or move to another great church or whatever it might be. We should always have that attitude of, hey, I'm a stranger here. I'm a pilgrim. I'll go, I'll obey, and I'll do it by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for uh, thank you for the great examples that we have of those that obeyed you, Lord, that you've set them, put them in your word, Lord, that we can look to them and understand how they did these things. We can look to them and understand that the things that we're going through often are, are pale in comparison to the sacrifices that others have made, and, and not to mention that of, of the Lord Jesus himself, the, the great sacrifice that he paid for us and coming and dying on the cross for us. Father, help us to always keep that in mind and help us to uh, understand that we are strangers here, that we're programs. And Lord, if you'd have us go to a place and, and to do a work for you, Lord, we should count it a, a joy and a blessing and a privilege to go out and to serve you wherever that might be. We ask that you would just bless us now and keep us safe as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.